Second Interlude The Hindrances and Problems All the mental skills needed in meditation are innate abilities we can selectively choose to cultivate. It's no different from acquiring any new skill, whether learning a science, a musical instrument, or how to throw a frisbee. We are actually just training ourselves in a way that favors certain inherent abilities over others. Think of meditation as mental training that exercises certain mental muscles so they respond more easily and better serve your needs. Just as the mental capacities we develop and use in meditation are completely natural and normal, so too are those activities of mind that can hinder or even defeat our practice. Traditional meditation literature identifies five specific hindrances to overcome before we can make real progress, and understanding them will prove invaluable. In daily life, these so-called hindrances actually serve necessary and useful purposes. Once you're familiar with them and how they work, it becomes obvious that neither suppression nor self-punishment will help you surmount such established and often helpful conditioning. On the other hand, positive reinforcements of other natural tendencies of the mind that oppose these hindrances works very well. Remember, everybody faces these challenges. They're not unique to you, and they're not personal shortcomings. More importantly, and very fortunately, these hindrances are well understood, and there are effective methods for resolving each and every one of them. The Five Hindrances We can trace almost every problem in meditation to one or more of five innate and universal psychological predispositions, known as the five hindrances. Worldly desire, aversion, laziness and lethargy, agitation due to worry and remorse, and doubt. They are called hindrances because they hinder efforts at meditating and create all kinds of problems in daily life as well. Therefore, as countless meditation manuals recognize, learning about them at the start is crucial. Even though these innate predispositions cause problems, we have them precisely because they were useful to our species as we evolved. The first step toward working with the hindrances skillfully is to understand the purposes they ordinarily serve. Second, you will cultivate five meditation factors. Directed attention, sustained attention, meditative joy, pleasure, happiness, and unification of mind. Each of these acts as an antidote to one or more of the hindrances and contributes to a key goal of meditation, purifying the mind of these powerful facets of our biological programming and of their negative influences. We discuss the five meditation factors in depth later in the book. Make no mistake. Overcoming these hindrances won't deprive you of the ability to survive and care for yourself. In fact, it's just the opposite. We have evolved other abilities, such as intelligence and cooperation, which fulfill the same needs more effectively and with fewer problems. As you stop relying on this once useful but now outdated programming, you will be more fully awake, better able to make clear-headed decisions, and take the appropriate actions. You will also come to realize that these hindrances are the basis for the stories and melodramas the mind concocts. Examples of stories rooted in worldly desire include, I need a beautiful house, and I want a successful career so I can be happy. Examples of stories rooted in aversion include, I hate rude people. It's not fair that they always get what they want. I don't want to be sick today, or I can't take this place anymore. Examples of stories arising from laziness and lethargy include, I'm too tired to help you right now, and it's too late, or a waste of time to try to finish that project. Examples of stories tied to the agitation due to worry and remorse include, what if I get caught, I'm ashamed of behaving that way, and I'm afraid. There are also self-defeating stories steeped in doubt, such as, I can't meditate, I'm too clumsy to play, and I'm not good enough, smart enough, fast enough, and so on. 
These are the stories that largely define our lives. But through meditation, we can question and eventually move beyond the narratives that hold us back. Familiarize yourself with the hindrances and their antidotes and learn to recognize them, not only in meditation, but in daily life as well. Your effort will pay off. 1. Worldly Desire Worldly desire, sometimes called sense desire, is when we pursue, delight in, and cling to the pleasures of material existence. This also means desiring to avoid their opposites. These desires include gaining material objects and preventing their loss, having pleasurable experiences and avoiding pain, achieving fame, power, and influence while avoiding infamy and impotence, and attaining the love and admiration of others while avoiding hatred and blame. In Buddhism, these are sometimes referred to as the eight worldly dharmas. Here's an easy formula to help you remember them. Gain loss, pleasure, pain, fame, obscurity, and praise, blame. This kind of desire is so fundamental a part of our biological programming that you may have never asked yourself why it exists or questioned the effects it has and whether you'd be better off without it. Worldly desire evolved because in the natural world we have to strive for the resources we need to survive and reproduce, and that takes effort and motivation. We are programmed from birth to take pleasure in, desire, and pursue the very things and experiences that help us stay healthy, get a mate, and provide for our offspring. And we are social animals, so we take pleasure in and crave acceptance, status, and power because they are important to our survival and reproduction as well. The innate predisposition to desire whatever brings pleasure has made humans very successful. Yet when it comes to the effects of desire on your life, consider that the world has changed since these desires first evolved. Sex, food, especially high-calorie, fatty, sugary, and salty foods, and labor-saving devices are far more available today. Unrestrained desire leads not only to overconsumption and health and relationship difficulties, but many other issues that get revealed through meditation as well. That said, meditation doesn't involve repressing worldly desires. It gives us direct, experiential insight into the many ways the desire leads to pain and anxiety. This insight frees us from being ruled by desire so we can cultivate its opposite instead, non-grasping and equanimity. Our new motivations will come from a place of generosity, loving-kindness, and shared joy. We will discuss these positive qualities in later chapters. Worldly desire is so deeply embedded in us that you may have trouble imagining how we could live without it. However, as intelligent beings, we no longer need to be driven by compulsive desire in order to take care of ourselves. We can act effectively from a foundation of reason and equanimity. Furthermore, generosity, loving-kindness, and sympathetic joy will only serve to enhance the survival of social beings like ourselves. Nor does eliminating desire lessen our experience of pleasure and happiness. Free from craving and filled with love, we become more fully present for positive experiences of every kind. The practices in this book will make you more aware of desire and give you many opportunities to practice abandoning it. Unification of mind is the meditation factor that specifically opposes and is opposed by the hindrance of worldly desire. As the mind becomes unified, worldly desire weakens and eventually disappears, not only during meditation, but from daily life as well. Experienced firsthand, this is an extraordinary transformation. You don't grow stoic, indifferent to pleasure, or lose your motivation but rather are filled with joy, calm, and contentment. A unified and blissful mind, in other words, has no reason to chase worldly desires. You will live a more dynamic life, not constrained by craving, and you will be open to many more possibilities. 2. Aversion 
Aversion, sometimes called ill will, is a negative mental state involving resistance. Its most extreme form is hatred, with the intent to harm or destroy. But any compulsion to get rid of or avoid unpleasantness, no matter how subtle, is aversion. Dissatisfaction and resentment, most forms of criticism, and even self-accusation, impatience, and boredom are forms of aversion. As with the other hindrances, aversion has been helpful for human survival. In the same way that we're programmed to take pleasure in and desire anything that supports our continued existence, we're programmed to experience displeasure and aversion toward what is potentially harmful. Aversion motivates us to avoid or eliminate what is unpleasant. Aversion hinders meditation in several ways. For instance, thoughts about someone we don't like, a dreaded future obligation, or regrets about the past easily become distractions during meditation. Judgment and impatience about our practice undermine our motivation and encourage doubt. In the later stages, subtle, unconscious traces of aversion can keep mental and physical pliancy from developing and prevent the meditation factor of pleasure-happiness from arising. Just as aversion opposes mental happiness and physical pleasure, the meditation factor of pleasure-happiness opposes aversion. Pleasure-happiness counters aversion by making negative states of mind impossible to hold on to, although they can return full force afterward. Simply put, there's little, if any, room for negativity in a mind filled with bliss. This is one of the reasons it's crucial to always seek out pleasurable feelings and encourage positive mental states during practice. You will learn to recognize aversion, replacing it with equanimity, acceptance, and patience. As these become your new predispositions, anger, cold-heartedness, and harmfulness are replaced by loving-kindness, compassion, and harmlessness. You'll be astonished at the profound transformation as aversion disappears from your daily life. 3. Laziness and Lethargy Laziness mostly appears as procrastination. Its counterpart, lethargy, is a tendency toward inactivity, rest, and ultimately sleep. Both involve a lack of energy. Each causes different problems, but together they form a powerful hindrance. When we lack motivation, laziness and lethargy arise and keep us from making enough effort. Laziness is being resistant to doing some particular activity. Laziness is usually thought of as something negative, but it serves a purpose. It keeps us from spending time and energy on unnecessary, unproductive, or unpleasant activities. That time and energy can then be used for activities that contribute to happiness, survival, and reproductive success. Laziness also motivates us to use our skills and intelligence to come up with easier ways of doing things. Laziness arises when the cost of an activity seems to outweigh the benefits. Lethargy arises when there appears to be nothing interesting, exciting, or potentially rewarding going on. This also serves a purpose. Our body and mind need time to rest and recuperate. Rest is a better use of time than engaging in unproductive activities. Like laziness, lethargy is an evolutionary adaptation for conserving time and energy. The essence of lethargy is a progressive, involuntary loss of mental energy. The longer it continues, the harder it is to halt this downward slide. There are two antidotes for laziness and lethargy. The first is to motivate yourself by thinking about future rewards. This means weighing the costs against the benefits in a rational and intelligent way, rather than just trusting your emotions. For instance, whenever you have trouble bringing yourself to meditate, you can recall all the benefits that will come if you keep practicing. So, to deal with laziness, you need to muster enough motivation to actually begin the task you want to complete. Dealing with lethargy means having enough motivation to complete the task, rather than quitting or falling asleep. The second antidote is to just do it. This means that you plunge in, despite resistance, and then engage with the task fully. 
This works well against laziness because the power of laziness lies in procrastination. Before we start an activity, we can question its value and suggest alternatives that seem more appealing. Laziness makes it hard to start a task. But once we start, it's easier to continue. If we get interrupted, though, laziness can return and make restarting difficult. In any case, since laziness often fades when we begin a task, just doing the task is the antidote. Engaging fully with a task also works against lethargy by re-energizing the mind. But how effective this is depends on how quickly we recognize the onset of lethargy. The meditation factor of directed attention opposes laziness and lethargy, and vice versa. This hindrance impedes directed attention because we cannot easily direct a dull, tired, and unmotivated mind. In meditation, just doing it means you keep directing attention to the meditation object, countering procrastination and any loss of mental energy. Eventually, directed attention becomes powerful and automatic enough to completely overcome laziness and lethargy. 4. Agitation due to worry and remorse We feel this kind of agitation when we're conflicted about the past or concerned about the future. This agitation can take the form of remorse for past unwise, unwholesome, or immoral activities, or for something we neglected to do. We may also have agitation due to remorse when fretting about the possible consequences. For example, you may feel remorse about an affair, either because of the pain your spouse would feel if he or she found out, or because of your own guilty conscience. Another form of this agitation to take is worry. Yes, we worry about the consequences of unwholesome actions, but we also worry about neutral actions. For instance, you may worry about whether or not you locked the back door. Even wholesome activities can cause anxiety. Perhaps you drove your friend to the hospital because she had the flu, but now you worry that you may have caught it. And once you start worrying, it often leads to more agitation as you wonder about how you might prevent or cope with the consequences of your imaginary scenarios. We also worry about very unlikely things, such as being caught in a terrorist attack. We can create endless combinations of worry and remorse for ourselves, all of which make us more agitated. Our predisposition to agitation due to worry and remorse helps spur us to correct things when possible, to protect ourselves when confronted by unavoidable consequences, and to prepare as best we can for an uncertain future. The mental discomfort also helps discourage us from creating similar situations in the future. However, if we can't put our agitated energy to good use, it makes us stressed because of our unresolved impulses to act. It also makes it harder to focus on anything else. Even when we consciously set aside or unconsciously repress worry and remorse, the mind remains agitated, affecting our body and emotions. Most of us are quite aware of the adverse effects of such stress. Yet in meditation, we discover directly how even negative actions from the distant past and long-forgotten worries can still produce agitation. They're like seeds buried in the unconscious furrows of the mind. Only when we become quiet enough can they emerge fully into the light of consciousness. Our past shapes our current perceptions and behaviors, and unresolved issues can stand in the way of peace of mind, joy, and happiness in the present. The best antidote to this kind of agitation is to take up the practice of virtue. When we behave virtuously, we don't create further causes for remorse or worry. But what is virtue? I don't mean morality in the sense of adhering to an external standard demanded by a deity or other authority, nor do I mean ethics, as in following a system of rules that prescribe the best way to act. Both moral principles and ethical codes can be followed blindly, without necessarily having to resolve your own bad mental habits. Rather, virtue is the practice of inner purification, which results in good behavior. If you think of the mind as an engine, the practice of virtue allows for the smoothest, most powerful performance. 
Likewise, every action that has an unskillful intent, even the most subtle, is like a small bit of grit reducing the mind's performance. As a virtuous person, you'll enjoy a peace of mind that enables you to reach the highest stages of meditation. Of course, there are many other benefits to being virtuous, but the practice of virtue is intrinsically rewarding. While training in virtue helps prevent misconduct in the future, the other remedy is doing whatever is possible to resolve any existing sources of worry or remorse by taking positive action. After you've done what you can, you must forgive yourself and seek forgiveness of others for what can't be resolved. Then let go once and for all of these events and any judgments about them. A deep purification of the mind happens in meditation, and a large part of that purification involves putting to rest concerns about past misconduct, actual or perceived. Agitation due to worry and remorse is a specific state of mind. The meditation factor of meditative joy is also a state of mind. Since the two are opposites, they cannot exist together. The continued presence of this agitation interferes with the arising of meditative joy. Similarly, as the mind becomes more joyful with continued practice, agitation due to worry and remorse dies down. Joy overcomes worry because it produces confidence, optimism, and the certainty one can handle whatever challenges life may present. Likewise, joy overcomes remorse because a joyful person sincerely regrets any harm he or she has caused in the past and is eager to set things right. 5. Doubt Doubt is healthy and valuable when it motivates us to question, investigate, and try things for ourselves. It keeps us from blindly accepting what others say or what seems true, and from being misled and taken advantage of. As a survival strategy, it keeps us from wasting our time and resources. Doubt begins as an unconscious mental process that focuses on negative results and negative possible outcomes. Once the mind decides a situation should be examined more closely, the emotion of doubt becomes part of conscious experience. If the feeling of doubt is strong enough, it compels us either to reevaluate an activity or to abandon it altogether. The purpose of doubt is simply to challenge the strength of our motivation, inviting us to test our current activities and intentions with reason and logic. Doubt becomes a hindrance if, Instead of re-evaluating the situation rationally, we respond only to the emotional uncertainty it creates. Too often, that keeps us from making the effort needed to validate something through our own experience. We can never succeed at any difficult task if we simply abandon whatever makes us uncertain. Doubt in this form is more like a perverse faith in failure that saps our will and undermines our intentions. For example, if you doubt your ability to succeed in meditation, your motivation will fade and you won't sit down to practice. The remedy for doubt is to use our reasoning abilities to envision the possibility of long-term success, countering the short-term emotional pressure of this hindrance. Once we've overcome the paralyzing effects of doubt, we can move forward with stronger motivation and through action achieve certainty. The ultimate remedy for doubt is the trust and confidence that come from success, and success depends on persistent effort. Although doubt is often projected onto other people and things, it often takes the form of self-doubt, a lack of confidence in our own abilities. Of the many forms doubt takes, self-doubt is so pervasive that it's worth addressing specifically and providing a few more assurances and antidotes. If you doubt your ability to concentrate, just remember that even though some people are calmer by nature than others, very few have such active minds that they cannot meditate. Even serious cases of attention deficit disorder don't prevent people from achieving the highest goals of meditation. If your mind is really more active than average, the first three stages will be the most challenging. But rest assured, not only can you master them, 
but the stages after will come much more easily. For some, self-doubt is about self-esteem, specifically about comparing yourself to others you believe are brighter or more capable. In fact, intellectual ability isn't that important for success at meditation. Meditation is about attention and awareness. If you can listen to this book and follow the instructions, you have more than enough intelligence to learn to meditate. For that matter, even if you don't understand some of what you hear here, by just following the basic instructions for each stage, you will succeed. Some doubt they have the necessary self-discipline, but if you can exercise regularly or go to work or school, you can establish a practice. The key factor isn't discipline, but rather motivation and habits. If you find yourself questioning whether you have enough discipline to meditate, instead, re-examine your motivation. Without motivation, Discipline won't help much. Making meditation a habit is also critical. Because we're in the habit of going to work, even when reluctant, we do it anyway, and often without giving any particular thought to the consequences. Habit is powerful. In Stage 1, we discussed ways to create the conditions for your practice to become a habit. Doubt obviously stands in the way of persistence. Conversely, the meditation factor of sustained attention, achieved through consistent effort, is what overcomes doubt. That is, as you keep applying yourself, you'll learn that you're capable of sustaining attention and achieving other positive results. Success leads to trust in the practice and in yourself. Once you realize that, you'll completely overcome doubt. The Five Hindrances Hindrance Worldly Desire Explanation Pursuit of pleasures related to our material existence and the desire to avoid their opposites gain, loss, pleasure, pain, fame, obscurity, praise, blame Opposing meditation factor Unification of mind A unified and blissful mind has no reason to chase worldly desires Hindrance Aversion Explanation a negative mental state involving judgment, rejection, and denial includes hatred, anger, resentment, dissatisfaction, criticism, impatience, self-accusation, and boredom. Opposing meditation factor. Pleasure, happiness. There's little room for negativity in a mind filled with bliss. Hindrance. Laziness and lethargy. Laziness appears when the cost of an activity seems to outweigh the benefits. Lethargy manifests as a lack of energy, procrastination, and low motivation. Opposing meditation factor. Directed attention. In meditation, just do it means directing attention to the meditation object to counter procrastination and loss of mental energy. Hindrance. Agitation due to remorse and worry. Explanation. Remorse for unwise, unwholesome, immoral, or illegal activities. Worry about consequences for past actions, or about things you imagine might happen to you. Worry and remorse make it hard to focus mental resources on anything else. Opposing meditation factor. Meditative joy. Joy overcomes worry because it produces confidence and optimism. Joy overcomes remorse because a joyful person regrets past harms and is eager to set things right. Hindrance. Doubt. Explanation. A biased, unconscious mental process focused on negative possible outcomes. The kind of uncertainty that makes us hesitate and keeps us from making the effort needed to validate something through our own experience. Self-doubt saps our will and undermines intentions. Opposing meditation factor. Sustained attention. This is achieved through consistent effort. Success leads to trust, and doubt disappears. The Seven Problems The classical five hindrances give a general description of the psychological obstacles to meditation. Different combinations of these hindrances lead to specific challenges I call the seven problems. 
You will face them all as you progress through the stages. And in each stage, we provide the details about specific problems and how to overcome them. Use the list as an easy reference guide linking specific problems to their hindrances. This will help you quickly grasp what problem stems from what hindrance so you can apply the appropriate antidote. 1. Procrastination and Resistance to Practicing The hindrances of laziness and doubt contribute to procrastination and resistance to practicing. If we are not convinced meditating is worth the time and trouble, laziness manifests as resistance. This is where doubt enters in. You may begin to doubt your own abilities, the teacher, or the method. Any of these can strengthen procrastination and undermine your motivation and determination. 2. Distractions, Forgetting, and Mind-Wandering The hindrances of worldly desire, aversion, agitation, and doubt can all manifest as distractions that cause forgetting, then mind-wandering. Thoughts about the worldly dharmas, wealth, pleasure, fame, and praise are far more engaging for a novice than the sensations of the breath. Even trivial desires, like wanting to check your email, are distracting enough to cause you to forget the breath. Aversion to bodily pain, noises, or other distractions can disturb your meditation, as can feelings of impatience, boredom, or dissatisfaction with your progress. The emotional charge of feelings like anger and resentment makes you want to mull them over, rehashing conflicts and planning responses. Worry and remorse likewise produce distracting thoughts about the past or future that take you away from the present. Thoughts related to doubt easily become distractions as well. 3. Impatience Impatience is rooted in several of the same hindrances as distraction and mind-wandering, aversion, worldly desire, and doubt. The difference is that impatience manifests as a disruptive emotion rather than as a distracting thought or memory. 4. Monkey Mind Agitation due to worry and remorse often causes monkey mind. It can also be caused by anger and aversion the anticipation of fulfilling a strong desire, or even the restlessness that comes with impatience. In fact, monkey mind can stem from any of the hindrances, except laziness and lethargy. 5. Self-doubt The hindrance of doubt is at the root of self-doubt, as discussed before. 6. Dullness, drowsiness, and falling asleep the hindrance of laziness and lethargy create dullness and drowsiness, but it's mostly due to lethargy. Lethargy is a decrease in mental energy that manifests as a comfortable, pleasant dullness of perception, or as heavy drowsiness. As mental activity dies down, mental energy falls, as do interest, awareness, and responsiveness. 7. Physical Discomfort Worldly desire and aversion are what make physical discomfort into a problem. An itch, for example, is simply stimulation of the skin, but it turns into suffering when aversion and the desire for the itch to go away arise. The Seven Problems and Their Antidotes Problem Procrastination and Resistance to Practicing Antidote Frequently recall the benefits of practice constantly refresh and renew your motivation, and just do it. See Stage 1. Problem. Distractions, forgetting, and mind-wandering. Antidote. Each part of the problem is addressed sequentially. In Stage 2, work with mind-wandering. In Stage 3, work on overcoming forgetting. In Stages 4 through 6, work on overcoming all distractions. Problem. Impatience. Antidote. Rather than identifying with impatience, learn to observe it objectively. Cultivate joy, peace, contentment, and equanimity. See Stage 2. Problem. Monkey Mind. Antidote. An agitated, overly energized mind is in constant motion and can't stay focused on anything. 
The antidote is to get grounded in the body. See Stage 2. Problem. Self-doubt. Antidote. Do everything you can to keep your motivation strong. Don't compare yourself to others. Make meditation a habit. Problem. Dullness, drowsiness, and sleepiness. Antidote. Decreased mental energy leads to dullness, then drowsiness, and sleep. Counter strong dullness by energizing the mind using techniques described in stages 3 and 4. In stage 5, work on overcoming subtle dullness. Problem. Physical discomfort. Antidote. Find the most comfortable position possible. Refer to stage 1. Use physical discomfort as part of the practice to develop the insight that pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Refer to stages 3 and 4. In conclusion, the five hindrances are more than just obstacles to meditation. They are the same obstacles that thwart a happy, productive existence. By practicing meditation and overcoming them, we accomplish something of inestimable value, which has far-reaching benefits for every other part of our lives as well. When you achieve Stage 10, 